Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the fourth Saturday of the month, which means it's time for Overcoming Autoimmune Diseases with Dr. Micah Yu and Dr. Melissa Mandala. Please welcome them both back to the show. How are you guys doing today? Wonderful. It's great to be here again. Yeah, thank you so much for having us again. I love it. I, you know, we have a few husband and wife teams on, on the regular lineup, and I love it because it's so much easier when you guys are on the same page nutritionally, isn't it? It is. We can cook together, eat together. It's simple. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel bad, so bad for the families where it's, they're they're eating differently, and it's, it's, it seems to be such a stressor, especially on the person that wants to eat healthy and feed the family healthy. And that, you know, the, it's I, I hate to be like to say this, but it's usually the husband that's the, the one that's not on board, not the wife. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I had to get him first. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, you know, you. Would, I felt like with the movie Game Changers, it was so compelling that that would be enough just for erectile dysfunction prevention to get men to just want to eat healthier. But you know, I think that food is just food addiction is so pervasive that I don't understand why more, more people aren't interested in eating healthfully. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it's just about knowing what to cook and how to cook. And most women know how to cook. <laughs> I mean, especially with the work you do where you work with patients that just by changing their diet, they're actually able to overcome autoimmune diseases, which many people think are, are not overcomable. That's yeah, true. exactly. It's it's sometimes it's a roadblock or they think it's a dead end, but there's so much you can do. Yeah, absolutely. So what are you going to talk about today? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about mast cell activation syndrome. And so we treat it in our clinic. Sometimes they go to me first or him first, but it's definitely a complicated disease. It's definitely takes a team. Uh, so yeah, it's one of those things that we see every day. That's it. That's really interesting. And I'm sure there's going to be viewers that haven't or know somebody that does. So thank you. Yes, we'd love to talk about it today. It's a fun topic. Good. I love medical stuff. I'm like, a, I should have gone to medical school. It's too late now in my 60s. But at, how do you remember everything? I mean, you must have to learn so much stuff. It's incredible. Yeah, I think practicing practice makes perfect, uh, but medicine's always changing. So nothing's ever perfect in medicine. That's probably why they call it practicing medicine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And we're the ones where, you know, before it was the, the note cards. Now there's virtual ver note cards, but you're just always on, you're always finding mm -hmm. something new, just like cooking. There's always new techniques. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, it's just fascinating. I just, I, I love science. Even when I was little, I lived in Chicago and there was a museum called the Museum of Science and Industry. And it's just, I find science just fascinating yeah I love that place actually it's it's you can just read and read and you feel like um there's always more you know okay. you <laughs> there's always something new so mast cell activation syndrome yes and it's called MCAS if you, that's easier to say okay, <laughs> you can great. say that nice all right like I'm looking forward to the presentation all right let's get started uh, let me share our screen here share screen and I think this is it. Perfect. And Perfect. thanks for your questions last time, everybody. We really appreciate that. And let's view show slash show. Perfect. Perfect. Do you see our screen, Chef AJ? Absolutely. It says MCAS. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. So this is a really complicated topic, but we just want to break it down because to us, it's so important because it's underdiagnosed, um, undertreated, and a lot of people feel like they're going in circles. They see many types of doctors. They go to the ER because they're in a bad situation where they don't understand what's happening and it can be very very confusing a lot of times they have to go in the hospital and they get sent back home and they end up getting the same syndrome of symptoms so we're going to just break it down to you um this is us and we have um, nothing to disclose we just love educating everyone um and i'll talk about micah um so he's um, my husband, but he's also great because he's done a lot of studying. So Dr. Mike Yu, he's board certified in internal medicine, rheumatology, lifestyle medicine. He also got an additional integrative fellowship at the Andrew Wild um, um, Integrative Fellowship at University of Arizona, and then certified in functional medicine through the Institute of Functional Medicine. And we're both co-founders at Dr. Lifestyle. 
And then a little bit about me. So I'm a board certified in family and lifestyle medicine, and I love psychiatry. So I went into that in uh, UCI and then also uh, finished and completed Integrative Psychiatry Institute. And also um, lifestyle medicine is complicated, meaning um, there's many layers to it. And so I did another fellowship in that. And that's why I have the intensivist um, background and then former board um, member of American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So you can see us at Dr. Lifestyle. And just in case you forget where to find us, we uh, love creating content that's easy to digest and can be useful for you on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. Um, and you can find Dr. Micah Yu at MD, And then uh, his website is myautoimmunemd.com. We have tons of newsletters that we can share more information. And I'm at Dr. Melissa's Kitchen on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok and Facebook. And here's my website, melissamundalmd.com. So you can see us also at the clinic at drlifestyle.org. And we're in Orange County, Newport, California, but we see patients all over the U.S. and globally. So reach out to us if you have questions. So uh, the main flow of this presentation is to just define what mast cell activation syndrome is, um, tell you about how it got discovered, the history and how it's developed because it is fairly new um, and also talk about why it happens, the pathophysiology, what the triggers are, what you can watch for because it's hard to pinpoint why it happens. Um, a little bit of the diagnostic testing, there are some methods to do this um, and then how it can be diagnosed but also it can be confused with a lot of other diagnoses. That's why I always say reach out to a medical professional because it can be overwhelming. And then potential treatments that are in the making. So here's our mess cell. Imagine a hot air or a balloon, a water balloon or a hacky sack. Um, it's very, um, there's granules inside um, and, and the layer is very thin. When you have um, other, you have this, uh, imagine this water balloon, it has sensors. So that's what the antigen is for. It's a protein. And you sometimes you have something called IgE to be more specific, which is your, um, your antibody. So IgE is the antibody, antigen is the protein. They have a reaction. And when things are um, foreign or things are unregulated, um, they get angry and they start to release something called histamine. So that's your water bottle just popping and it's flowing out and it just goes everywhere and the body gets really confused. Just like a, um, a hacky sack, you imagine all these granules hitting all the sy symptoms or systems. And then that's why people get a constellation of symptoms, fainting red eyes, um, sometimes a huge um, anaphylaxis reaction, itchy skin, hives, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and um, high heart rate and wheezing. So those are some signals. Um, so we're going to go through this um, presentation to just define it a little bit more. Um, everyone maybe <laughs> has gotten some type of allergic reaction if it's from um, latex or a bee sting um, or some other insect bite, you tend to swell up and it you get something called a hive. Sometimes people um, go into this reaction of feeling itchy, um, a little lightheaded, and sometimes that itchiness in your throat and feeling like you're actually choking or short of breath. Um, so I know that can be very scary. There's different levels of what that reaction is, but just to define what mast cells are. Um, so mast cells are well known for releasing histamine as we talked about, and you can have this allergic reaction to most common is pollen or instant insect stings. So that's what we see. Um, and then it's usually environmental driven. Um, and when we see that um, it interacts, not just your skin, but also your lungs, your GI tract, um, and many other sim um, systems. And so when we look at the responses, um, we can understand a little bit more of what that means. Yeah. So um, mast cells, like uh, Dr. Melissa Mandala here said that um, they are algae cells. And when the IgE um, antibody binds to the protein, it creates this reaction where these mediators um, get released from the mast cell that causes allergic reaction. And there are so many things that can stimulate it, um, including insect bites um, that we mentioned earlier, but other things that we'll talk about more like medication, certain medications, certain um, environmental factors, um, pesticides, the cleaning sprays, and all that stuff. If patients are not reacting to those wells, they will have a mast cell response. And 
this is what a mast cell looks like. Oh, sorry, our dog is barking. <laughs> but these are mast cells here. These are the granules. And when the allergen attaches to the Ig antibody, then it releases the granules. And then patients have a variety of responses depending on where it's being released. And mast cell activation syndrome is pretty much the mast cells overreacting in a very abnormal way. Um, so usually when you get an allergic response, you might get it um, like eye allergies, sinus congestion issues, but these patients will have even more systemic issues throughout the whole body, including rashes throughout the body, um, upset uh, GI tract, diarrhea, um, even some over light, over left food, uh, overnight food can trigger these responses. And mast activation syndrome is different from mastocytosis. Mastocytosis is an overproduction of mast cells, and that usually goes to oncology, um, where they have to treat um, mastocytosis. Mast activation syndrome usually goes to the allergy doctors, but it can also go to internal medicine doctors, primary care, and other um, different fields as well. So I, as a uh, rheumatologist, also treat mast activation syndrome. It's typically not treated by rheumatologists, but I've expanded my scope of practice and I'm very comfortable treating it. And so is Dr. Melissa here. So how was mast cells discovered? So it was discovered in um, 1879 by this Dr. Uh, Paul Eric, and then it was later recognized in 1863. But really the disease itself didn't get recognized till much later on. Um, so it wasn't recognized until the 1990s. And even then, um, we didn't really officially recognize it until 2007 when someone finally mentioned it when they were studying mastocytosis, when they saw all these um, abnormal reactions. So this is a relatively new diagnosis. Most doctors have not heard of this. Um, or even fail to recognize it. So I tell my patients, you know, you, my patients that have this, as you get gaslighted, they go from doctor to doctor because no one is able to identify it and diagnose it. So I tell my patients, you know, it's a relatively new diagnosis. That's why your doctor probably didn't know about it in the past. And um, there are several articles here talking about mast cell activation syndrome here on the right. So, yeah, so this is actually from the Annals of Allergy, um, and so that's a well-respected journal, and they have been recognizing it, and as you can see from head to toe, um, it's not just your runny nose and nasal congestion that you just treat with Claritin, and, or, and you feel, oh, that it, you're throat will go away. Um, it's actually, sometimes people, it's just headaches um, and feeling overwhelmed. Um, people don't realize um, that they might be a little bit more anxious, not because of the symptoms being so new and hard to um, cope with, but because um, there is a neuroinflammation um, a type of um, allergy in their brain um, because um, the mast cells also can go through the brain, the blood brain barrier. And sometimes that affects um, functioning. Um, I have some patients, literally, they have difficulty finding the words to say. So that's called word difficulty finding. Sometimes they're a little um, slower to learn new things or they're um, forgetful. Um, and it's literally not just because of um, their age. And, and I would say sometimes people can experience this even in their 30s. Um, and then having some type of cognitive dysfunction where they feel um they, they can't get through the day, um, they can't multitask as well, or they're feeling depressed. Um, so you, you know me, I, I really take, pay attention to the gut brain access, immune access. Um, and then also sometimes people have the generalized itching, angioedema, which basically means um, they are, their tongue may be swelling, their throat might be swelling, shortness of breath, wheezing. Um, and there are times people can have that chest pain. Um, so this can be confused. Is this an anxiety attack? Um, is this a heart attack? Um, and it's because of a, a immune response um, throughout 
the body. Um, and then some people have the uncomfortable feeling. Um, they uh, they think that they're allergic to food and they may be um, because their body talks, especially they get blo um, bloating, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and that's really uncomfortable. It can be often confused with IBS and SIBO. It can be confused with other types of diagnoses. Um, and But we look at the whole body um, and other times people have muscle pain, joint pain, muscle aches. Um, other times they feel the urgency to urinate. Um, they have reflux. Um, their blood pressure goes down. Um, the heart rate goes up, just like we talked about in previous lectures. Um, and then they might also have that flushing. Um, for example, when people go run, um, sometimes people get really, really red. Um, so sometimes out of nowhere, they eat something or they may be exposed into the environment. Like when you go um, outdoors running through the park or through a national park, you may see that your face is red. You're probably in um, reacting to something in the environment. Um, and then also, some people have this urgency that they have to use the bathroom or it does affect hormones. So um, and there's a reaction with estrogen and sometimes their periods may be extra long or painful. Um, and for males, um, they may it may affect their um, their male um their sex drive, um, and they are more prone to infections. Um, most common complaints are fatigue, just feeling like they just want to lay in bed, feeling weak. Um, and then the worst case scenario are just the anaphylaxis where people have to be um, hospitalized and have um, steroids and other treatments in the ER because it's life-threatening. And a mass cell activation, um, uh, I think we've talked about this a little bit already. It can be localized or systemic. Um, and Dr. Melissa just talked about most of these symptoms already. You can get um, hives, you get rashes, endodema, you get face get swollen, you get flushing on the face, um, your face can get red. Um, you can get diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and cramping as well. And these patients also have a fast heart rate potentially, and they can feel like they're fainting when they stand up and they could be wheezing and also a lot of congestion symptoms there. And before we talk about triggers of mass activation syndrome, I want to talk about why patients can sometimes be gaslighted. And even though they go to different doctors, including allergists, sometimes they don't get the answer. It's because there's this disease in its infancy embryo stage of research right now. It's recently recognized in 2007. So you can imagine there is not enough research yet in this. So there are different um, thoughts on how to diagnose it. Um, and we're going to talk about some labs later on, um, but labs wise, some labs can be negative or all of them can be negative. You can still have this disease, so it can get very tricky to diagnose. So triggers that you need to be aware of for mast cell activation syndrome are, uh, we talk about insects and um, some um, animals like jellyfish stings and stuff like that, but there are medications that can do it. Um, antibiotics, muscle relaxants, um, even IV, uh, radio contrast materials and MRI and in CT scans, but also um, the excipients, which are the fillers of the medication, not the medication itself, but the, the actual coating of the pill can cause a mass activation syndrome response in patients. And we see that a lot in our patients. So it can get very hard to treat and diagnose. And changes in temperature can definitely do it. Even changing ele elevation and altitude can also trigger this to flare. And some of my patients will react to massages, friction, and alcohol is a big one. Chocolate can be a big one. Fermented food, um, emotional stress, um, certain exercises, spicy foods, and infections can definitely do these as well. All right, so let's talk diagnosis. Like I said earlier, um, there are labs that we have, but all the labs can be negative and you can still have this disease. So it can sometimes you have to have a very good clinical history in the clinic so that you can understand from head to toe what is going on with the patient and recognize the patterns. So this is one of the criteria out there. They said that you have to have two organs involved. You, have, you should have um, a lab that's elevated and there should be improvement in symptoms after treatment. But of course, not all these things exist in every patient. And some of the labs that we test for are tryptase and methylhistamine, prostaglandin, leukotriene E4. Um, and um, they said that you should get tryptase 
lab drawn, right? 30 minutes to four hours after symptoms. That's not very practical. Most patients are not going to go to lab 30 minutes to four hours after they get an attack. Um, and in our area, at least, you have to have an appointment and those appointments don't aren't available until like a week or two weeks later. So um, it's not that practical. And you want to talk about so thoughts? yeah, uh, with mast cell activation sh syndrome, um, there are other mimickers of this. So um, we talked about histamines being released from the mast cell, but there's also something called histamine intolerance. It's called HIT. And that basically means sometimes it's not just our environment, but something that we're eating um, that triggers the similar symptoms. And I know food can be complicated and it's not necessarily um, how how it um, we are mentally reacting, but physically our body is reacting. For example, um, there are certain foods that have high histamine and they can often get uh, the similar reactions, the runny noses, the high heart rates, the menstrual cramps, the bloating, and some maybe rashes. And what we oft often see is that we have to be very uh, mindful in talking about nutrition and what they're eating from start to finish of their day. Um, and then sometimes we can see key patterns. So here are some management and symptom treatments. So of what we do and other practitioners do and some potential treatments. Um, one of the most important thing is just being aware of what's going on um, in your day-to-day -day and tracking, uh, logging not only what you're doing and what you're eating, where you're going. Um, most commonly, um, the first thing to do, I say, is understand um, what medications, what supplements you're having, and then have a list of what foods you're eating and um, drinks that you're eating, um, the odors you're around, um, it can be anything from your perfume to your soaps and shampoos to your um, your detergent, um, all of these can trigger. Um, and sometimes um, their activity level, um, sadly, um, even though exercise is so good, um, exercise can trigger um, a mast cell or some type of histamine response. And then knowing what ideal temperatures are important for you. Um, so if you need to get extra layers, um, go ahead, put it on. Or if you know that you can't overheat, um, that's also important. So it is definitely um, a lot of internal work. I mean, it takes two um, to understand what the triggers are. Definitely, there is um, some initial management that needs to be done, an, aller an allergy workup, because it's not just mast cell activation. It can be uh, other types of sensitivities. Uh, you have IgE, IgM, IgG, all these other um, labs that um, we can order. But um, most of the time, we have to understand the trigger. And yes, the emotional stress is a major um, trigger for many people. And so kind of when you have an I when you know a little bit more, if you know your labs, if you know the potential diagnosis, this can help you um, just stay calm and understand that this is part of the journey of healing. And most of the time when we know what we're facing, we are able to um, be uh, able to track it a bit more and find potential treatments. Um, and so Dr. Yu will talk about the treatments that we can try in the clinic. Yeah, so there are um, treatments that can be done from one more mild to more severe treatments. So um, omaluzumab is a medication that allergists prescribe that can help control allergies. Um, that's usually used in more um, cases where the more mild medications aren't controlling it. And the mainstay, the foundation of treatment are antihistamines. These are ones that you can buy over the counter, um, Claritin, um, Benadryl. Some of these are the ones that can be used um, daily to help patients control symptoms. And if they're not, sometimes you use Montelukast. Um, aspirin can be tried as well. And sometimes steroids are also used as well. There are other treatments as well, but these are the foundation to it. And other treatments um, include some supplements that um, include um, some quercetin or vitamin C can help as well. There are other treatments with food. Food is a big one going on low histamine diet. It's really important. And fermented food are the ones that you know can trigger a lot of these patients. Um, alcohol, chocolate, citrus fruits as well. Um, soy fermented products, unfortunately, can also trigger patients. And certain fruits and vegetables can trigger as well. Tomatoes. We have patients that can barely eat 
any food because of this mass activation syndrome. And they work with that our dietitians that we work, that we really enjoy working with. And it can still be very hard. Even the doctors and dietitians that are very competent in this disease, it can be a struggle sometimes to help the most um, difficult patients that react to everything. So it does take time to heal and it can be a very slow process, but patients can get better. Yes. And the main thing is uh, seeing that they, you know, eliminating cheese, um, alcohol, um, some of the, even here you can see eggs, cured meats. Um, it's, so once we find um, the fine balance um, of, you know, the variety, I think there's more variety in, in veggies, but uh, at the same time, we, we kind of go phase by phase of what can be um, introduced uh, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And a low histamine diet, um, like I said, can be helpful, but you can also supplement with the DAO enzyme, which helps break down intestinal intestinal histamine. And you can buy this over the counter, um, but definitely consult with your doctor before doing so. No supplements are 100% safe. Um, and we mentioned earlier, citrus fruits can be a trigger. I mean, every patient is different. Not everyone will react to citrus fruits or seafood or papaya, but um, these are the ones to be aware of, such as fruit, seafood, papaya, tomato, nuts, pineapple, spinach, and chocolate and strawberries. These are the ones that have more histamine uh, releases. And areas of uncertainty and opportunities to research, we still need to know what are the exact triggers of mass activation syndrome. We have a lot of them, but I'm sure we have ones that we still don't know of. And there's no current evidence that suggests that, you know, um, abnormal mast cell phenotypes result in ongoing um, mast cell release and increased um, tryptase level um, can be helpful in diagnosis, but most of the time it's not there. And when you have mast cell activation syndrome, we need to be aware of other diseases such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and postural orthostatic hypotension, which is known as POTS. These three diseases go together. So we see one, you might see the other two. And COVID-19 can lead to an exacerbation of MCAS or it can lead to a new diagnosis of it. And here's a journal article. It's talking about long COVID and mass activation syndrome. So patients that are going from doctor to doctor don't have any answers for the symptoms. They might have mass activation syndrome from COVID. And this can be missed a lot from um, doctors. So moving on. Yeah. So all in all, um, we know that mast cell syndrome is something that um, requires a, a complete um, discussion <laughs> with um, your doctor, but also just start journaling. Understand that you can do something about it by knowing what our triggers are um, and also bringing that to the table, If knowing if it's food, environment, um, and then we'll, re we'll work with you. I think there's so much to learn and we always want people to know that they're not alone in this. And so that's why we consistently research and and also want to bring this education to others. And I want to mention that um, even though mass activation syndrome isn't an autoimmune disease, we do see it in our autoimmune patients a lot as another disease or syndrome, which is why we're bringing it up today. Um, and it's a disease, it's an inflammatory disease, it's an allergy inflammatory disease, but it's so important. And a lot of people aren't aware of this. A lot of doctors aren't aware of this. So it's really important that we talk about it today. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. That photo of the hand, that was crazy. Yeah, it's like almost like a baseball hand and, you're, and, and it's very complicated. And, you know, sometimes you just give steroids and you're you're lucky uh, or Zyrtec or Claritin, but sometimes it can just be all over the body. And some of the foods you mentioned are some foods that people really like, like chocolate, yeah. for example. I mean, it's always, it's never, you know, it's never kale. <laughs> it's never kale, exactly. <laughs> That's something that, what is the first step? Like, how would a person even know to even think about this? Or do, do, do doctors generally think about this? Um, in my experience, um, no. Uh, this is a disease that, you know, it requires some reading. Um, it takes time in the clinic to actually get a complete history. You know, you have, what, 15 minutes with your doctor, typically in a clinic setting. This takes over half an hour just to, I would say, we spend an hour with our patients in the initial visit. So we go from head to toe. You have to ask, ask patients like 
what happens to you when you eat certain foods? What happens to you? Does, do you get immediate symptoms? What are your symptoms? And you have to take the pattern. Sometimes it's hard to diagnose on the first visit. It takes several visits with the patient to do a relationship to get a pattern. Um, so most patients um, haven't even heard of this. So if, if patients are getting repeated attacks of anxiety, repeated um, allergic attacks after eating certain foods, or if you diarrhea immediately after eating, this could be the potential diagnosis and you need to go to a doctor that even knows that this exists. Um, and if they don't understand it, they need to refer out to a specialist that can understand it, which can be an allergist. Yeah. And even then, I, I, I feel like people that suffer with any kind of food allergy intolerance, because I have many allergies, we suffer so much because it makes it so hard to go to somebody else's house for dinner. We don't yeah. want to be difficult or go to restaurants. But if you have this, you realize it's just it's never worth it, you know, to, to eat something that, you know, is going to make you sick. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's half the battle is um, we can't always know when you eat out what they're putting. They put all the ingredients there and label it, but then you don't know what the cross contamination is or um, you don't know um, the, sometimes the waiters or and they try to ask, they do their best, but there's always a, that chance and it's hard. It's truly hard to kind of dissect what what's being put in the food when we eat out. And I have the same struggle too. And but when we're at home like you, 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 you know exactly what you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> Like, for example, I'm allergic to black pepper. And so the restaurant will say we're not using it. And then I'll get sick and then they'll go, oh, well, it was in the broth. Well, then you're using black pepper, right? So <laughs> it's so hard. It's so, and people say, why don't you like restaurants? Well, this is why. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Is there something that all autoimmune diseases have in common? Um, All autoimmune diseases have in common. They, they're all inflammatory. Um. And let's see here. What would you say they have in common yeah, the most? I, well, I, okay, I, I got one. Okay, tell me. <laughs> they, it can take um, a lot of patients. They get gaslighted. Um, it can take multiple doctor visits and over three, four years to get an actual diagnosis. The average time is a lot longer because sometimes they get stuck at the primary care doctor's office, to be honest. And um, we uh, most primary care doctors like me before I would just say, well, take your Claritin and Zyrtec, you'll be fine. <laughs> um, yeah. And just be aware. And I, and I think that's okay, but sometimes it can really affect people's lives. Sometimes they can't go out, they can't really work and um, they, st they feel like they can't um, take care of their family because they're so they're suffering inside. So I think that's the hard part is um, autoimmune diseases are pretty serious. Um, and at an even very young age, um, a lot of women get it, um, teens, 20 year olds, and it is a lifelong disease for some people. Um, and but it is something that we the sooner you find a clear diagnosis, so don't give up, I say, just keep finding um, people on your side, find answers. And then the more you know, then you're able to live longer, um, live a little bit more happier. And then be able to function and find what you can eat and enjoy. Yeah. Which autoimmune diseases would you say are the most common or which are the ones you see the most? And do they tend to be more prevalent in men or women or is it an equal opportunity destroyer? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it usually occurs in women more about, I would say 80% women compared to 20% men. Uh, of course, it varies from disease to disease, but mostly most of the diseases are usually women. Like lupus, for example, is a 90, 9 to 1 ratio of women to men. And if men get lupus, it's usually more severe too. Um, and uh, what was the other question? You had a first part to that question. Um, which one is either the most common oh. or which is the one that you guys see the most in your practice? That's right. Oh, yeah. So uh, rheumatoid arthritis is probably one of the most common ones. It affects around 1 million Americans and it's rising every year. So we see rheumatoid arthritis a lot in our clinic. But of course, we see a whole bunch of other ones. Psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis. We see lupus in our clinic. Um, we are seeing more mass activation syndrome in our clinic too. So those are the more common ones. Um, celiac disease is rising as well. Um, so there's about a 8% rise, average rise of autoimmune disease every year throughout the whole world because the environment is just nuts. So is it because of all the chemical, I mean, is this why it's, it's, it's more prevalent? Yeah, so we have our food is more processed these days. There's more stress levels, especially with COVID-19. There is more um, people are exercising less. They are sleeping less. They And the environment is just being more polluted. The chemicals, the glyphosate, the um, 
all these additives, the coloring, the dyes, um, everything's adding up. And it's just uh, the sparking autoimmune is triggering autoimmune disease to either flare or to start occurring. Yeah, that's that's a, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Have you ever seen water fasting help patients, or is it something you ever use in your clinic? Yeah, so um, Melissa uses it too, and I use it as well. So of course, we don't have patients do a ten day water fast in our clinic. They, that needs to be more supervised. So there are fasting centers that do that. So fasting can help. Water fast can help. So um, I have arthritis too. So if I feel like something's coming on, I just do a twenty four hour water fast, and I get better right away. Um, and I tell my patients the same, you know, if, if you are still like you're about to flare or flaring, just do a water fast for a day and then you should at least feel some relief. That's great. And that would probably be safe for most people to do. Yeah. It's a safe, I think, suggestion. Um, and, but some patients, you know, they have eating disorders. So I say, maybe you don't want to do a water fast and they said, I don't want to do it. I have an eating disorder, but, um, patients that want a longer water fast, there are many great centers, like, you know, the ones in Northern California near you. Jeff True AJ. North, we have that. True North, have yes. The show all the all the time. Yes, thank you. That's yes. great. Is yeah. interstitial cystitis an autoimmune disease, and is that one that you guys have dealt with in your practice? Because I, I hear from a lot of people that they have it, and it's terrible. Yeah. 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 So basically, um, when we look at mast cell um, activation syndrome, it's interestingly um, linked to interstitial cystitis. You can see that there are certain other diseases, um, especially with women, the bladder, um, um, the vaginal area. Um, they, it's just very really irritant. It's not just a yeast infection or a UTI, but um, because um, they have the sensation of wanting to urinate. Um, but yes, there is an allergy component as well. Yeah. yeah. So and I feel I feel so bad like you because you're saying even children can get these autoimmune diseases. Yeah, that's true. I've seen two year olds get these diseases, um, arthritis where they have to have steroid injections at a really young age. Um, so it's really sad, you know, when it when children get at such a young age, like one or two years old with autoimmune disease, it's it's more genetic than environment at that point. And steroids are wonderful in, in some ways, but the, but long term they can have side effects, can't they? Yeah, I have a hate love hate relationship with steroids. Mm -hmm. Steroids are my quickest answer um, for patients, but it has the most damaging long term side effects. Um, so if patients take it for like a week, it's no big deal. But if you're taking right. it for years on end, man, it's a it can be a nightmare. I'm I'm somebody that 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 has been suffering from asthma my whole life, and most of the time I don't have it. But when I get a flare, it's like the only thing that, you mm -hmm. know, will break it. And it's like, but I also make it, I feel so good when I'm on them. I'm like, boy, I liked it. But I understand you can't take them. But I, I it's such a, it's such, like you say, it's such an interesting drug because it does make you feel better and it makes you feel better fast. Yeah, it's, 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 it'll be the perfect job. It didn't have the side effects. Exactly. Exactly. Well, actually, uh, because they knew you were coming on the show, we have uh, some questions that were submitted and I'd love for you to answer them if you can. The first one is from Dana and she asks, does your lymphatic system being slow or not working efficiently? Could that be a cause of autoimmune disease? If that could be true, how can you make your lymphatic system work better? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, autoimmune disease is not from a slow lymphatic system. Autoimmune disease comes from um, two factors. One is genetics. The other half of the equation is the environment. Um, and it depends on the patient. Some patients, the genetic factors are stronger than the environment. Um, but the environment um, is mostly in the equation. So that equation includes diet. It includes stress, uh, sleep, and it includes exercise. And it also includes environmental factors as well. Pollution, we know that pollution leads to more increased risk of rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and multiple sclerosis. We know that um, pesticides also lead to increased risk as well. There are a couple of uh, scientific articles out there on this already. So it's not the lymphatic system at this time. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to say anything? And I think, sure, no, I think maybe that question probably stemmed from treatments such as lymphatic drainage. I think people think, you know, when you have an infection, maybe that can help. Um, the science um, is not very clear. Maybe it feels like a sense of relief, but it's not really treating the root cause. Thank you. This is from Suzanne. One person in my family had, I think, Sjodren's for about mm -hmm. 10 years. It affects her eyes, bones, and teeth. 
She's recently gone plant-based. What other advice would you suggest for this autoimmune condition? Maybe you can say what it is, because I don't even know if I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, great question. So um, Sjogren's is an autoimmune disease, usually manifested by dry eyes and dry mouth, but there are many other organs involved. Sjogren's, usually you get dry eyes and dry mouth because the autoimmune attack goes to the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands of the eyes. But you can also have involvement of the lungs, you can get arthritis, you can get rashes, you can get nerve problems and um, brain problems too with this autoimmune disease. And besides going plant-based, the, all the lifestyle factors are really important that we talked about. Are you exercising enough? How much are you sleeping at a good time? And are you, or are you waking up in the middle of the night every two hours? Um, did you have any um, trauma in the past? Was there any abuse growing up as a child or even as an adult? Um, did you have any traumatic events? Were you in a war? Did you see a lot of... Um, disaster happening around you um also the environment did you grow up on a farm with a lot of pesticides um do you work directly spraying pesticides um do you live in a really polluted area um how much plastic are you using all these things are part of the equation um unfortunately there's no one perfect answer sometimes you know plant-based can magically fix things um other times you know it's part of the equation and we need to look for other things that can help with it as well great thank you this is a question from Doreen, and she said, I was having an allergic skin reaction around my eyes, face, and neck, so I stopped gluten and cruciferous vegetables, and it seems to have gone away. I know that cruciferous vegetables are an important part of our nutritional needs. Is it possible to eat them again? Yeah, so um, maybe you can answer this, Melissa. Um Oh, yeah, you want to start first? Oh, sure. You know, I think when it comes to cruciferous vegetables, you know, it's a it's a huge um, family, you know, bok choy and broccoli, cauliflower. Um, I think we have to um, sometimes people can know first by eliminating and then reintroducing a little bit at a time. I would say do it under guidance um, um, with a healthcare professional team, nutritionists, RDs, um, doctors, just so that you know the amount to use um, because you can maybe tolerate it for a couple hours, but maybe... Um, next week you you might not be able to trigger or um, tolerate it so um, I would say work with someone because <laughs> it is possible but we can't know 100% until we know the big picture of things great thank you and there was a second part to her question which I think is just a great overall question does or can autoimmune disease ever go away yeah so I would say you can never cure it um, it's not curable. I know people, they go to remission. So remission is possible. So we have lots of um, people, uh, folks from eyes and other uh, outlets, uh, news outlets that say that they have um, put their autoimmune disease to away. So when that happens, I will call it remission. It's like taking medication and you don't have any more pain or disease symptoms. That's remission. But once I think if patients go plant-based and they go to remission, but they start eating other ways that you that um, trigger the disease in the first place, then yes, that autoimmune disease can come back. So I, I can't say it's curable. Thank you. Are there just certain foods that are, the, are more like, would you have like a hierarchy of inflammatory foods, like maybe dairy being at the top? Yeah, right dairy at the top. Exactly. Dairy, processed meats, um, sugars. Um, what else is there? Salty High food. salts. Um, I'd tell just, just try to avoid, number one step, stop eating out fast food restaurants i would think though that's the number one step um and then try to eat at home more it's more controlled environment yeah what, what can i ask what do you guys eat <laughs> um yeah so um we yesterday what do we have we had some quinoa some brown rice we had this really good um um what was it kong, pu, kong pao tofu tempeh dish <laughs> i mean it was really nice because it had cashews and um quinoa and yeah. then well, we love beans we had um some salad yesterday yeah we always like a mixture of fresh and raw and cooked with um, veggies and grains um we're big fans of beans um, um um, I'm the one doing a lot of cooking, but he loves his miso broth and bok choy. Uh, yeah, I put miso uh, paste in my hot water with green onions, tofu, mushrooms, and bok choy and other green veggies. And um, Melissa gets really sick of that. <laughs> that, sounds, that actually sounds really good, especially it's in yummy. the cold weather. I, I can eat that often, but I, I like variety. <laughs> um, we, we do green smoothies too. The other day, we put a spring mix uh, into the blender with um, dried dates, uh, green tea powder and almond milk and we just blend it up and that was our green smoothie 
Mm, delicious. Do you guys have time with your busy practice to exercise? Yeah, yeah we yeah. love exercise. Yeah, <laughs> I do kung fu, so uh, that exercise. You're kidding! Oh my god, yeah. that's, that's... <laughs> yeah. I'm all bruised up. <laughs> we, we, I, I we spar, we fight in uh in the gym. That's. I mean, it's it's. It. I don't know if I'd like to do it, but that's so cool that you do it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He tries to invite me over, but I said no. Not. I'll I'll stick to my yoga and my spin class. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the. It's so funny. Those are the exact. Because I don't. You know, I know they say we need nutrient diversity and exercise diversity. And while that may be true, I always say, you know, just do what you can. Like it's better to eat the same vegetable every day than to eat none, no vegetables. And I get stuck stuck in what some people would think is an exercise drop it those are the exact two I do I spin and I do yoga because it's really all I like I just I've tried other things and I don't like them yeah mm -hmm. we're the same like there's not there's you know I think once you find the music and the and the place you yeah. like then <laughs> Just, we just got not? a rowing machine and I just, I mean, and it's in my bedroom, which is like, I have to look at this huge thing. And it's like, do I really, I just, I just am so resistant to new forms of exercise. It's hilarious, but I'm as glad to hear that. Do you do a particular kind of yoga? Um, I like the hot yoga, yatha, um, form yoga. Um, they have some interesting ones. Have you seen the ones where um, you, you can use a belt to help you like really stretch or they have circles and then you can use that on the floor to stabilize you instead of the, the blocks. So that's kind of fun. Um, but I know Michael always asked me to do some resistance training <laughs> because no, he wants I, my bones <laughs> to be strong. No, I need to do that too. I do. I love yin yoga and I love, we did a stretch where the, the strap was behind our neck and our our leg was up and I, I just love that so that's very cool I wish we lived in the same city again then we could go to yoga together well you guys are just wonderful thank you so much for doing this and I just I love learning about these things from you and you know this is not a topic that I don't think has ever been covered well, certainly hasn't been covered on my channel but it might help somebody that doesn't have an answer to to even ask for this you know yeah, it's uh, it's very complicated, and it's great that you have such a big reach, and it will help a lot of people with this topic. Yeah, I think I can't wait to see what you're going to present next month. Thank you so much, doctors. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great Thank Saturday. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Chef Kelly Williamson, and she's going to be doing an Italian feast. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.